do yoga, whatever you have to do, and then come back to me and we'll do it all again. So, the question then is, are you ready for a story? Yes. Are you sure you're ready for a story? Yes. Are you ready for a story that will traumatise you and then you have to go, oh my God, I wish I had told that story? Yes. yes. Okay. So I'm going to start with a very short story with my family. And it's just kind of a nice, it fits in with the kind of idea of, you know, the kind of, the whole idea of, of, the, of the Kiliak and the, the kind of the old woman characters throughout this time of year. It's a story that my mother told me. And it's a story of something that she encountered when she was a teenager. And my mother, her family, um, kind of originally came from Ireland, settled in Scotland, were quite poor. And then what happened was, when my mother was a teenager, her father died, her father Patrick died. So they had the funeral, and a lot of folk came to the funeral, we could reenact it just now. Because <laughs> folk get drunk at funerals have a great time, and then, oh, there's always babies after funerals, it's shocking. Uh, so, they had the funeral. And then the family, they sealed up the house and they went off to Ireland, they went off to relations in Ireland, for one. And then they came back. When they came back, it was my mother, who was with 14 in this hand, and her mother, my granny, big pig, her mother, they came into the house to get the house ready for the rest of the family. And when they stepped into the house, my mommy always tells me when they stepped into the house, she heard the sound, okay? screaming sound. And it really terrified with this screaming, screaming sound. And suddenly she realised it was a cat. It was a cat in the house screaming and screaming. And it was coming from the bedroom where her father had died, my grandfather died. And so I'm just going to pause it there. So this screaming going on, what's going on? Well, this strange things go on and strange things do happen in Scotland and Ireland because all her life my mother her mother had told her about this woman <coughs> and lived locally that she would never go near, okay? And she was growing up as a wee girl, she'd sometimes see this woman and her mother would say, don't go near her. And she got older still, she got to know where the woman lived, where her house was, and her mother would say, don't go near that woman, never go near that woman, okay? And so she was a kind of, one of these wee kind of scary wee women that lived in the town, she just don't go near her. So there's already weird things going on when my mother lived. And now there's something even weirder going on. She spent her whole life in told to avoid this woman down the road. And now she's in the house, and she, the room where her father died is full of screams. So her mother opens the door, and they look in, and she saw a huge cat, a huge cat on the bed where her father died. And the cat was tearing at the covers, and it's up and his eyes were freezing and it was screaming and screaming and screaming. And so my mother's mother closed the door and she turned to my mother and she said, do you know that woman I told you about that you never ever go anywhere near? Well now you have to go and get her. And my mother's like, okay, I'm 14, I'm a teenager, I can deal with that, fine. Uh, fine, tick tock, let's deal with this. So she went and she got the woman and she brought it back to the house. And the woman, she came in, and the screaming cat was still in the room, they could hear it. My mum always remembers, there was a sense of anger as well, of rage and anger in that room. And the woman went in, she shut the door, and my mum said she couldn't hear what the woman was saying. She could just hear the, the, the cadence of her voice, it was quite <coughs> quiet, almost like uh, singing a lullaby. And the cat began to quiet and quiet and quiet. And eventually the cat was quiet and there was no noise. And then the woman, she came out of the room and she called my mother and her mother in to the room. And the cat had gone. And what my mum always remembers is that not only the cat vanished, it just gone. But that sense of rage and anger had gone as well. It was really peaceful in the room. And the old woman turned to my mother and her mother and said, listen, your father, your husband who died, 
His soul was trapped down here. Your grief was so heavy, it was wide about you. And he got trapped here. And he got trapped in the shape of a cat. But I've assured him now that you are well, you are fine, and that he can pass on. And now he's went on, and he's in peace. And that was it. And the, and the cat was gone, and all that grief was gone, and all the anger was gone, and all that was left was this lovely sense of peace and love. I mean, my mum would tell me this story, and she'd tell me this, and she, what I'm going to tell you now, she said, do you know, in life, there's always a time when you're going to need a priest. You're going to need a priest sometimes, okay? Or you're going to need a doctor sometimes. Or sometimes you're going to need a lawyer, okay? You're going to need a lawyer sometimes, okay? But my mum said, there's some times in your life where none of them can help you. And the only person that can help you is the crazy old woman down the street. <laughs> Okay. So that's kind of the theme we're going with tonight. All right, we're going on a crazy old woman thing. That's what I'm channeling tonight. I may actually turn into a crazy old woman. Um, crazy old woman who's looking for a cup of tea. Okay, so we haven't quite started in the evening yet. We'll just get these all settled. So he's all settled now. Alright, so I'm going to start with a nice wee story. Then we're going to have a break. He's going to recover. And then we'll come back and do more weird stories. So, this is a story from Renville up the road, okay? There's Renville and there's Renville, okay? It's very complicated. Renville is that way, and Renville is that way, okay? Just if you're checking a map. And Renville, it's in the very furthest west part of Connemara. It's right there on the Atlantic, okay? And for those who don't know it, go there. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. There's an amazing pub, kind of, it's like a pub, but there's rooms you can kind of hide out as well and crash if you get too drunk. It's right on the shore and it's an amazing pub. You, it's an amazing pub. You must go and get drunk there. Or, or not get drunk. Maybe just take a cup of tea and enjoy the scenery. There's a lot of different things. So, and it's an amazing landscape. I need to describe the landscape a little bit because you're right out there and you've got the big mountains behind, and then they kind of roll down towards the coast. And the ground, the ground looks kind of knobbly. It looks like uh, like giant's knuckles sticking out the ground. Okay? It's a beautiful landscape. And it's kind of green as well. It's green, rolling landscape. Very fertile, but very bouncy. Bouncy is angle. Rolling. And you've got lovely green. You've got fields. You've got roads. You've got buildings. You've got... Uh, Lovely like hedgerows, full of honeysuckle, and it's very, very, very beautiful. And it's a kind of landscape which goes all the way down, you teach all the way down to the Atlantic, you're right there at the Atlantic there when you get to the end of it. And the Atlantic's really it's very passionate at this point. It's never still, it's always churning and the waves are always moving. And it's incredible. And when it's a sunny day, it's just amazing. But even when it rains, it's amazing because the sun comes through the rain. It's almost like cold around you. So it's an amazing place. And there's a man who lived there, and his name is Jack Moore. Right, this is the story about Jack Moore. And Jack Moore, he was he was quite poor. All right. So he was poor. And he was always complaining about being poor and how it was affecting his life and how he couldn't get a girlfriend because he was poor. I know. <laughs> Girls don't care about money. They say, of course I love you, even though you're a tramp. <laughs> so, he was very poor. He was always complaining about poor. But what he'd done, which was quite good, is he would take walks in the evening. He'd go a big circular walk, he'd go one way, he'd take himself to the lower part of the hills, and he'd come back down a road and make his way all the way back down to the house he lived near the shore. So one night he'd done his walk. He was doing his walk, nice big circular walk. It's a beautiful night. The stars are out. They're up there like silver pennies. The stars are up there. He's walking. There's a scent of the honeysuckle. There's a lovely scent of the cow shit as well. That lovely small, lovely warm smell of cows. And he's doing all that. And he's walking along. And he's walking home. He's on his walk for a couple of hours. He's now walking home. And as he's walking home, his route takes him by a graveyard. As your group always does in these stories, okay? <laughs> so he walks by the graveyard, but he finds a church there, he says a wee blessing, he walks by, and he's still walking along the road, and he's feeling a bit more chipper, okay? He's walking along, and then he stops, okay? Because he sees something in the road, 
And he's looking. And he's kind of, in the, he's kind of looking through the gloom. They're trying to figure out what it is. He's thinking, is it a bag? Or is it a ball? Is it somebody left some clothes? And he gets closer and closer. He bends down and looks. And it's a head. Ooh. Oof. There's a head on the road, sat there, with its eyes open, staring at him. <coughs> oh, did you goodness. And he's looking at the head. Jack Moyes, before we went any further, these kind of things do happen in Scotland Island, but I'm actually quite relaxed about them. I can tell you more my family, she's like, yeah, of course. There's a head on the road. He's thinking, OK, there's a head on the road. Ha, that's a bit strange. And then he thinks to himself, well, I'm in the countryside. There's always been a farming accident. Maybe somebody's had their head kicked off by a cow or something. <laughs> and they went to bury the body. The head's fallen in the coffin, which is really bad, because then the head and the body won't be attached. They will be to heaven. Oh, and what I'll do, I'll pick the head up, and I'll go back to the, the graveyard there, and I'll just throw the head in the graveyard. <laughs> as you do, and next day, folk can attach the head to the body, and the body can go to heaven. Whew. Easy done, okay? So he picks up the head, like this. He picks up the head, and the head's looking at him. Oof. So he turns the head around. Just <laughs> look at you. <laughs> and so he turns around to go back to the graveyard. He goes, turns around like this. And it gets a shock. For standing outside the graveyard is a tall gentleman. Tall gentleman, fine broad shoulders, like myself, fine broad shoulders, very tall, fine looking. He's wearing very expensive suit, fine boots. He's obviously very rich, very affluent. You can tell he's a powerful man. He's standing there. But the problem with this gentleman was he had no head. <laughs> <laughs> so Jack Moore, you know, he's a quick thinker. He's thinking, huh? <laughs> Himself. That's a very powerful fairy. You can feel how powerful it is. And he's trying to remember all the things he knows about fairies. And for folk who don't know about fairies, sidebar, quick note on fairies. A long, 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 for no, for no, for no, for no, for no, for no, in heaven, there was a woman cried God and a man cried Lucifer. They had a big fight. Ah! They were beating each other up. It was getting crazy. They both called on angels to come and help them. The angels all jumped in. It was a big, oh, big stramash. There was bodies flying everywhere. But some of the angels went, ha! Crazy, we're not getting involved. So they can step to say that this, ha! Huh? And eventually, God, she kicked the shout of Lucifer, um, kicked him out of heaven, kicked all those angels out as well. And then she turned around and there were all these other angels going, ha! Huh. Yeah, fine, ha! Huh. So, and she went, You didn't fight with me! Yeah, but you can't punish it, you didn't fight against you. So, God said to them, I'll wear you to earth! And she cast them out to earth, they'd have to wait. Because God had a think about what to do with them. And those angels that were cast out to earth, it's a long story. They eventually became the fairies. Just trust me on this, okay? <laughs> and the point is, the fairies have a bit of a difficult relationship with humans, mortals, because God kind of likes the mortals, which is not what they should fairies. So fairies have a funny attitude towards mortals. Sometimes they can be really nice, sometimes they can be really nasty. Okay? And so in this case, you know, it's this idea that 
He's looking, Jack Moore's looking, he's realised it's a powerful fairy there, the fairy's looking at him, and he's thinking to himself, this isn't just a powerful fairy, this looks like the king of the fairies. This looks like Finbarra, the king of the corn fairies. And it was Finbarra, the king of the corn fairies. And Finbarra had a cup of tea with him. <laughs> He's a fairy, just got to his fingers with a cup of tea appeared. And Finbarra's looking down at him, and he says again, Thank you. Come with me, and I will give you a reward. Jack Moore's looking at Finvara there, <laughs> and he's thinking, reward, ha, ah, ah. money, gold, women, something, oh, okay, okay, big man, women, <laughs> come in, come in, <laughs> we call out women in the appeal, it's like, women, <laughs> fantastic, what, what, what else do we want, I'm going to try for a new PS4, you ready, PS4, <laughs> no, okay. So, he follows Finvara, and Finvara kind of walks back to the graveyard. And he's into the graveyard, you know, Jack Moore is a wee part of thinking, this is not a good idea. <laughs> There's another part of thinking, well, you know what, he found his head, he's going to give you a reward, this could be really good, you might never be poor again. There's another wee part of running through all the things you should never do with the fairies, there's a whole list of things you never ever do. The fairy, Offers you food, don't eat the food. They offer you drink, don't eat the drink or drink. Don't listen to their music. There's all these things. So he's thinking to himself, I won't do any of that. I'll just follow him and see what the reward is. So he follows him into the graveyard. And the trees are all kind of hanging over. It's very dark. And all you can see now is the figure of Finvara glowing. And Finvara goes through the graveyard. And he comes to this big gravestone, it's a big, big slab stone in the ground there. And Finvara bends down and with one hand, he lifts up the stone and he just throws it aside. And Jack Moore's looking and there's this huge hole in the ground, like six feet, a big, big, big hole, big wide hole. And it's gaping at him. It's almost like a huge mouth in the ground, ready to swallow him. And he's standing there, and the next thing is a clicky click noise, clicky click, and he looks and all these insects come out. There's, oh, there's beetles and earwigs and all sorts clicking out the ground. Oh, it's like, oh my goodness. And then all the insects all kind of line up. And then they've got kind of be kind of regiments. And then they all stand up on their back feet, and they salute. <laughs> and Jack McGoy says, oh, okay. It's Finvara saluting. Finvara says, it's okay. Do your best. And all the wee insects scuttle away. So Jack Moore is starting to think, this is getting very strange. Maybe it's time to leave. Maybe it's time to get an Uber and go. But he's thinking to himself, there's a lot of people thinking, no, stick with it, there's got a lot coming. So Finvara says, follow me. And Finvara steps into that big, big hole. And he steps into the hole, and there's steps. And the steps go down and down and down. And Finvara's going down the steps. And Jack Moore, he doesn't want to go down the steps. He doesn't want to be left out in this weird, dark graveyard with weird insects everywhere. And there's also a reward coming. So he follows Finbarra. <laughs> yes, I know. Just don't go there. <laughs> Just, guys, if anybody ever tells you to go into a big open mall in the middle of a graveyard, think about it. Come on, have a moment. Maybe Google search is this a good idea. Okay. <laughs> so he gets into the grave as well. He steps in, and there's steps. And he's stepping down the steps. And it's very tight space. There's the kind of... There's, there's soil, and there's worms, and there's roots of plants. He's going down this, these steps. And finally he's under the ground. And it's like a long cave. It's also like a corridor. And Finvara's standing there. And Finvara turns to him and says, What do you see? And he points to the cave. And Jack Moore looks, and all he can see is worms and soil, and he goes, I don't see anything. And Barra says, look hard. And there's something about Finbarra's voice, he doesn't want to, you know, annoy him. He goes, okay, okay. So he looks harder, there's a harder kind of thing, and I kind of, and then he sees it. He sees suddenly appearing three doors. Three doors appear in the wall of the cave, and now he's thinking, doors? 
There'll be rooms, gold, jewellery, women, <coughs> PS4s, there's going to be something in there. And the bar says to him, now listen to me. I'm going to give you some instructions. You're going to open each of those doors one at a time. You cannot step into the room. You will stand on the edge. You will look. You will listen and you will learn. But you will not step into the room and you will not speak a word. Jack says, okay, your majesty, big man, I can do that, no problem. So, Finvara says, open the first door. So Jack goes up to the first door and he opens the door. There's the whole speaking. And he opens the door and he looks in and he's wanting to see gold or something. He looks in and he goes, huh? Because what he sees is a kitchen, okay? There's a kitchen there, with a table, there's a window, there's a stove over there, and it's really manky, the table's manky, the floor's manky, the window's all greasy, the light coming in's all greasy, and he's looking at the stove, and there's a woman in rags at the stove, okay? And she turns around, and she's got a pot, and inside the pot is potatoes, and she comes over, and she slams the pot of potatoes on the table. Smack! And she looks at poor Jack Moore and she goes, There you go. There you go. You had your potatoes last night. You're having potatoes tonight. And you know what you're going to have tomorrow night? You're going to have more potatoes. I hope you enjoy them, and I hope you do not choke on them. <laughs> poor Jack Moore is looking up. And she starts going on with this. The sarcasm, and he wants to call out stop, but he knows what he's speaking. He's getting really upset, and then Finbara closes the door. Finbara says, listen, this woman lived a long, long time ago, and she was very, very poor. And her poverty, it made her sarcastic. Oh, she was an apple on the victory and sarcasm. And when she died, she went all the way up to heaven, and she was so sarcastic that St. Peter at the gate said, Away ye back to Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> the sarcastic folk went, Away back to Ireland. And so she stays here, and she'll stay here to the end of the time, bitter and sarcastic. And John goes, Okay, all right, thanks. Now open the second door, and you know what to do. Do not step into the room, do not speak, look, listen, and learn. Chapman goes, okay. So he opens his second door, and fully bit trepidatious, and he opens it, and the door goes, <coughs> and he looks in, and it's another kitchen! <laughs> what? And there's another greasy table, there's a manky window there, it's really dirty, dirty stove there, in front of the stove's a woman with rags. And a woman turns around, and she's got a pot, what's in the pot? Potatoes! Potatoes! But these potatoes are Burnt potatoes, a burnt black potatoes. She comes over, she slams the potatoes down, and she looks and goes, There you go! There's your potatoes, you faithless, useless man! Cry yourself, I you never want, and you never wanted! I you a fool! I wish you were dead! And she roars and roars, and poor me, Jack Moore's like, Oh! But he knows how to speak, and he's getting really, really, really upset, and he's shouting, shouting, shouting. And the father leans over and closes the door. Oh! Listen, sweetheart. This woman lived a hundred years ago, and she was very poor. And Paul made her so angry and so full of rage. And when she died, the rage and the anger were still on her. And she went up to heaven, and she was raging and warm at St. Peter, and he went, ho, 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 away ye back to Ireland. <laughs> and she was sent back as well, and here she stays, roaring and cursing, and she'll be here to the end of the time itself. Okay. Now, open the third door. I don't want to. <laughs> open the door, Jack. Okay. So Jack Moore goes to the third door and he opens it and the door goes. <coughs> and he looks in and what does he see? Kitchen. <laughs> you know this story. <laughs> the kitchen there. And there's a window, there's a table, there's a stove, there's a, home, there's a woman. But this kitchen is different. It's very different. The window's been scrubbed clean. 
the light that's coming through, it's like sunlight. You can see little motes floating in the sunlight. The table there's all polished. And he's looking at the woman there, and the woman the stove turns around, and she's got a pot, and inside the pot is... Potatoes! With the potatoes, she's coming over, and she smiles. And when she smiles, it's like she radiates this peace and calmness. And suddenly, Peter Moore's looking at her, and his heart, oh my goodness, it's like a stone he's been in the heart all his life, and it just crumbles away, and his heart opens up, and his chest opens up, and suddenly, he's just full of love. And she's looking at him, she's smiling, she comes over, and she puts the pot of potatoes down nice and gently, and she goes, do you know what? We've got potatoes again tonight. But you know what? I managed to get some butter, I've got some wild herbs, oh, I'll make a great meal. And she puts the butter on the potato, the butter's going down, all the golden butter, the smell of the butter. She puts the herbs on, the smell of the herbs. Oh my God, and Jack Moore, all his senses are gone, you know, he's, he's, he's falling in love with the potatoes, and he's falling in love with the woman, okay? He's, he's not quite sure which one is the stronger love. He does, <laughs> he does know. He's looking at the woman, she's looking at him, and there's laughter lines around her eyes, and she's smiling, and he's like, oh, Oh, he wants to step into the room and he wants to declare his love for her. He opens his mouth up and he's going to tell her. And he's going to step in, of course. And Barry grabs a hold of him, drags him, slams the door shut. Oh my goodness, the door was shut. But, but, and Barry says, I'll open it again. But you must not speak and you must not go in. Okay, okay, Jack Moore agrees. He just wants to see the woman one last time. So Barry opens the door. Jack Moore stands there. And he's looking, and the woman's still walking away, and she's got the potatoes there. And she looks up at him again, and she smiles at him again. But this time when she smiles, she stops. She suddenly stops moving. And the butter in the potatoes stops moving. And even the steam coming out the potatoes stops moving. It's as if somebody's pressed the pause button, okay? Absolutely still. And Jack Moore's looking at this. And even the lights kind of stopped, the remotes of light have stopped, all perfectly still. And then a strange thing happens. The light is coming through the window. That begins to move. The light moves. And the light becomes a kind of deeper gold. And the light goes round the woman. And it goes round her ankles, and round her knees, and round her hips, and round her neck. And the light goes all round the woman. And suddenly the woman begins to transform. She begins to transform her rags, become beautiful clothes. She becomes a bit full around, her hips stretch out. She gets lovely rosy cheeks. Her hair becomes thick and dark. And she's suddenly so beautiful. And now poor Jack Moore, oh my God, he's so in love now. And his heart's going boom and boom and boom and he really, really, really wants to just throw himself into the room. And he's going to go for it now. He's going to declare his love now, of course. Jack Moore brings him back. And Barra. Shuts the door a second time. That's it, he says. Door shut. And poor wee Jack Moore, he's standing there. And he wants back into the room. He's banging the room he wants. And he's going mad. He's banging and banging. And Finvara's pulling him back. He's trying to open the door. But the door will not open. And poor Jack Moore, there's tears pricking at his eyes. And he wants to go in and he wants to join the woman. And Finvara said, listen. The woman died a long time ago. A long time. She lived a long time ago and she was very, very poor. But when she was poor, you know what she did? Every day she looked for something to be grateful for. Every day she looked for something to a blessing in the world. And every day she would take her smile of joy and she would share it with the world. And when she died, she took her joy and her blessings and her gratitude. And she took them straight to heaven where she lived to this day. And then poor Jack Moore standing there and he's looking at the door and there's tears coming down his face and the door vanishes. And poor Jack Moore is heartbroken. And then he's not just heartbroken, he suddenly realises all the doors have vanished and he's back in the cave and it's very dark and he looks around and Finvar has left him and suddenly he's in this dark cave by himself and it's getting closer and closer and he's getting very frightened and he looks I can see Finvara in the distance going back up the stairs, so he runs to join him. Finvara goes up the stairs, up the <coughs> stairs. And poor Jack Moore, he's heartbroken, goes up the stairs with him. Finvara steps out the big hole. Jack Moore steps out the big hole. 
And when he steps out, it's really strange. Because he's not in the graveyard anymore. He steps out, and it's like a great green lawn. And on three sides of the lawn, there's trees, and there's a big forest trying to get on it. And the fourth side's a big house. And he can see lights are on, and he can hear laughter and all sorts of things and happiness. And Jinvara's looking at him. Jinvara says, sit down. And Jack Walsh sits down. A cap appears in the grass, and he sits down. The hole's gone, he sits down. And Jinvara sits with him. Jinvara says, you need to rest for a while. You've had a terrible day. And he clicks his fingers, and all these lovely drinks appear. There's Guinness, and there's Heineken, and there's... <laughs> Oh, lots of teeth and everything, all these beautiful there's champagnes and wine. He says, drink, he must be very thirsty. Jack Moore knew not to touch the drink. He says, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. So when Varag clicked his fingers again, food appeared. All manners of gorgeous food, and oh my goodness, poor Jack Moore was so hungry, his mouth was slavering, his belly was gurgling. Eat, says when Varag, eat. Jack Moore says, no, I'm, I'm fine, I don't need to eat. And Vara says, you must eat, even a little bit. And Jack Moore looks, there's a big apple. He says, I'll take that apple, I'll eat it later. And he takes a big golden apple and puts it in his pocket. And he's sitting there, and he's knowing not to eat, and he's knowing not to touch the food. And Vara's there, and he's looking at the house, and he's wondering, is this, is this the, the kingdom of the fairies? And then as he's looking, he sees figures coming out of the woods there. The figures come out, and they've got chairs with them. And they put the chairs on the lawn, and then they go back into the woods, and then they come out again, and this time they've got instruments. They've got fiddles, and they've got harps, and whistles, and alien pipes, and they sit down, and they begin to play music. And it was the most amazing music that Jack Moore had ever heard. All these instruments, they were playing with each other, the sound was playing, it was rising, it was soft, it was fast, it was dee, 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 dee. It was beautiful, it was calm, and Jack Moore is listening to this music, and as he listens to the music, all that grief that was in his heart, and all that pain, and all his worry about to and everything, it all just dissipated, and it was great, because his alarm went, and it was fine. <laughs> and this is good, he said. It's come at just the right moment. Very good, he gets the music. And the music, he suddenly drifted into the music and he felt so peaceful. And he rose with the music and he sank with the music and the music, it drifted and it rose and it fell and it turned and it danced. And the music seemed to stretch from one end of the universe all the way to the other end of the universe. And Jack Moore was in the middle of it all, floating and sinking and rising and filled with the beauty and the wonder Music. <laughs> he screamed and screamed and screamed and covered his ears because you could never ever listen to the music of the fairies. No way! And he covered his ears and screamed to block out the music. Ah! And he screamed and screamed and finally stopped screaming and opened his eyes. And the fairies had gone. Woo! And he looked around and the fairies had gone and the man had gone and suddenly it was all kind of. And the stars had gone. And the sky was grey, and he looked down, and now he's in the field. There was a field, there was a cow there, and the cow was going, boo. <laughs> <laughs> and he looks over the hedge, and he could see the church in the graveyard in the distance, and he thinks to himself, oh my goodness, it was all just a dream. I must have tripped and fallen to the field here and fallen asleep. It was all just a dream. And then he put his hand in his pocket, and in his pocket, the big golden apple and he was so hungry and his son was coming up now and he really wanted his breakfast and he looked at the big apple and oh my goodness but he knew he knew not to touch it and he went around the field and he thought oh, I saw the hawthorn tree and he dug a hole and he planted the apple and then he said a little thank you to the fairies and then he left the field and as he was passing the church he said a little thank you to God as well and he walked and the strange thing was with Jack Moore, well, he never became rich. He never got money. He never saw that beautiful woman again. And the strange thing was, well, he wasn't rich in money. From that day onwards, Jack Moore felt truly, truly, truly rich in something else. He 
felt truly, truly 